Thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Bruno Silva. I'm Solutions Architect at uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, I've actually been in academia for a while or related to academia for a while. Um, I was at UCL uh, working in the research computing team at the time, uh, which eventually became the Advanced Research Computing Center uh, that um, that um, colleague here, Ben, is uh, working at at the moment. Um, I've also joined the Francis Quick Institute after working at uh, UCL for about five years, was part of the setup of the Institute and, you know, helped set up the high performance computing systems there. Um, and then I was invited to, to work at AWS originally as a technical business developer for uh, research. And I'm working at senior solutions architects dedicated to research and innovation uh, at a thing called the Center for Digital Innovation, uh, which is a partnership between uh, AWS and UCL, which uh, I'll be talking about in a moment. Over to you, Ben, for an introduction. Thanks. Hi. Uh, so my name is Ben Thomas, uh, and I am at ARC at UCL, and my title is Principal Research Infrastructure Developer, and whatever that means. Uh, and uh, I mainly focus on sort of uh, both public and private cloud uh, infrastructure. Um, and I should point out today that the work that we're presenting, uh, the vast majority of it was actually done by Dan Giles, who was not able to be with us today. Um, so with no further ado, let's uh, get on the presentation. Uh, yeah, so uh, ARC is UCL's kind of uh, research and innovation service center um, for everything around sort of digital tooling uh, and services. And what's quite interesting uh, about ARC, at least within a UCL perspective, is that we are both a professional services department and we have an academic mission, which is somewhat unusual within uh, within UCL. So we run services, um, including sort of uh, tier two HPC, um, but we're also really into kind of uh, research and teaching and innovation. And particularly when it comes to the RSE uh, faction of ARC, um, we consider ourselves to be very proud middle authors. That's where we where we want to be. Um, and despite the fact that we obviously have uh, a job to run services and uh, do research, uh, UCL really wants to push more into the innovation space. And uh, that's where the Centre for Digital Innovation comes in. Right. So um, about three years ago, um, we started formalizing a, a partnership between AWS and uh, UCL. Uh, with the idea of um, basically helping to solve and address uh, ch grand challenges um, that are of social impact, right? Uh, so you can hear, you can well, read here the the motto: UCL and AWS have joined forces to build uh, innovative digital solutions to the world's problems in healthcare and education. So that's the sort of the two key focuses here. Uh, and the UCL Center for Digital Innovation, powered by AWS, will lead us to solutions that are evidence-based, commercially sustainable, and focus on the needs of world citizens. That's kind of the, the grand vision that was set out. Uh, we've uh, started working then with UCL to set up what's called uh, an impact accelerator. And um, you'll see here, so there are actually you know three categories of things we do. Uh, we have this impact accelerator that, that uh, I'm, I was referring to, which is essentially the focus of uh, the work we're presenting here. Uh, there's also um, doctoral scholarships that are available, uh, assigned to uh, PhD students uh, across UCL. And of course, we have the responsible um, innovation lab that's more to do with the AI ML uh, and you know, how to do that in a responsible uh, way, uh, which is very much a topic of the moment. So again, the focus of what we're going to present today is on the uh, impact accelerator. And this is essentially where we've had a number of um, startups, spin-outs from UCL, some external startups as well, coming in uh, and seeking support for uh, ut utilizing cloud resources, and in this case, AWS, to uh, either begin their journey and, and create uh, a minimal viable product or a minimal lovable product, as we'd like to say in, in AWS, um, and then basically kickstart their, their innovation journey. So that's essentially sort of in a nutshell um, what we're going to talk about today. So as part of this um, impact accelerator, as I mentioned, we've, we have like a 12 week engagement with one cohort of around four or five startups that then receive support, dedicated one-to-one -one support from solutions architects. 
uh, and that support being being mainly one of uh, like advice and consultancy. So uh, steering people towards the best solutions, uh, giving them some ideas about how to solve their problems. Uh, but in in the end, it's the efforts that the the, the teams make that drives them forward. Okay. Um, and in this particular case, and what we're going to talk about today is the case of two startups, uh, one called Chronostics and the other one called Storgene, both of whom had a very similar problem to address. They wanted to basically uh, process some data that they have in hand, wanted to analyze it um, on some kind of compute resource, uh, process it, and then return the results, something very simple. But because it was something that was done in common, between uh, between them, we decided actually to uh, work with ARC, the Advanced Research Computing Team, and maybe try to come up with a repeatable pattern, something that's straightforward and simple that could be reutilized uh, across potential other startups or research projects that would uh, emerge out of, um, out of UCL. And so it is, as I was mentioning earlier, again, something that provides the ability to upload data trigger a containerized processing pipeline, produce some outputs, and then present the findings. So really simple, really straightforward, and really as a mechanism to get people familiarized with you know, setting up infrastructure and cloud services uh, in a way that's um, reasonable. We actually have something called the well-architected framework that I'll refer to in a moment that supports uh, that kind of work. So how was this done? So the Processing pipeline was developed in a procedural language called Terraform uh, that's uh, developed by HashiCorp. Essentially, it's uh, a form of representing infrastructure as code. Um, and we did this in a sort of modularized way. So, uh, you know, things can be picked out, put in, plugged in, et cetera, as, the, as it's required by, by further development. Um, the uh, Again, we leverage the thing called the well-architected framework, which is essentially six pillars, uh, you know, the cover aspects of uh, you know, operational excellence, security, um, uh, cost efficiency, cost performance efficiency, sustainability, et cetera. So there's a number, number of these which I, I won't delve into uh, today, but um, suffice it to say we have that framework to support the deployment of these, uh, of these uh, infrastructures. Uh, again, it it's, does something that's um, that comes with a modern paradigm of serverless, which you, it's not that there are no servers. There are servers there, but the AWS looks after all the infrastructure and everything that's um, involved in maintaining the resources that that are used uh, for uh, for compute, for storage, etc. Um, and it gives a also a paradigm of just um, utilizing exactly what you need when you need. Right, so so it makes it. It's not like you have a standing infrastructure that's there all the time. Uh, it's something that you can invoke uh, on demand when you need it, and then it stands down when it's complete. That's kind of the idea behind this, or, or at least what what we're trying to achieve. Um, again, um, Terraform, as as I mentioned earlier, is kind of a declarative language uh, that defines a target infrastructure, um, and you can use it across multiple cloud providers. So. That's actually one of the tenets behind um, ARC is not to be, they don't want to be sort of um, limited to one single provider when they do their work. Um, that's the wrong, wrong button, oops, jumped ahead. Right, so so this is it. It's very straightforward. And what I'll do is um, walk through this step-by-step step to explain uh, what's going on. So um, the, the flow is quite simple, right? So we have something that will, probably be a component of something else, a larger infrastructure that will receive data. Could be from an actor, could be from a service, um, a security perimeter, something like that, uh, and uploads the data to a storage system. This storage system that's presented here uh, is called uh, Simple Storage Service. It's S3 in, um, in AWS. And um, it's, because of its nature and, and the ease of use, it can, um, very simply uh, allow you to store the data. And then, for example, if you want to keep it for some time and want to minimize the costs, you can tear it down to an archive layer automatically, right? You just set out the policy to do that. It's called intelligent tiering. Very simple. It just happens after some time, you know. Uh, 
And actually, this intelligent tiering system can actually analyze the data that's in the storage uh, system and then decide based on you know how long it's, it's been there, among other criteria, how long it's been accessed or how frequently it's accessed. It will automatically uh, store the, those data uh, in archive to, to reduce costs, essentially. Um, so it goes into S3. Then S3 actually has the ability to um, trigger an event. So when something happens, like, like for example, a file is uploaded onto um, the, the, the storage system, it can trigger what's called a Lambda function, so this serverless uh, execution function as a service um, that uh, will essentially just trigger then in itself another system, which is step functions, which is a workflow management system. Okay. So this workflow management system then again invokes a number of steps. Uh, one of them is to synchronize the data from S3, which is an object store. So it stores objects rather than um, files in a POSIX file system type of way. Um, and it synchronizes that to a, a elastic file system. Um, that's a POSIX store in itself that will be presented then to a container that's hosted in a service called Fargate, which is again a serverless uh, container service. So all you need to do is specify the, the number of vCPUs you need and the rest of the infrastructure is dealt with. Um, then once that processing is done, so that synchronization VFS processing is triggered, uh, then that data is synchronized back to, uh, to S3. That's kind of the, the linear, linear process. Um, so one thing to note here is that we have step functions there as a, um, a, a future proofing feature. This is a linear process, so we could literally just go and, and trigger linearly uh, steps in execution. But what we've done here is um, introduce something that's a bit more uh, flexible in case there are future needs. And for example, the company decides to introduce more complex parts of this workflow uh, that involve you know, a more state machine-like definition. Okay. So again, then going this step-by-step in -step, simple storage service I was mentioning it earlier, um, it has a, an interesting feature called the pre-signed URL for example, that allows you to securely in an encrypted way send data based on you know utilizing a URL that's uh, you know that encrypts the data in in transit, stores it on S3, uh, and then evaporates that that URL disappears. So it ensures security, um, and again it's got the tiering configuration that's automatic. So it's very simple and straightforward to take forward. Then you've got the lambda function again. It's the the workhorse of uh, modern, modern serverless systems, really, which is uh, you know, as, as described in the slide. Um, but in essence, it's, uh, it's just a function as a service. It triggers a few actions. Uh, it, it can run for very short-lived periods of time. You can have a number of them uh, invoked at the same time and at any given time. And then when the function terminates their execution, everything is you know, just disappears. The function is vanished. Right? So you don't, you don't have to worry about something that's running there all the time. Um, and this, again, triggers the uh, step functions. Step functions, again, is a state machine. So um, it's a serverless workflow automation system. Um, and again, you can use this to coordinate any um, sequence of events, uh, be there as linear, parallel, et cetera. So you can find loops, et cetera. So, and actually, uh, I believe you're going to show the diagram later. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just to give a sense of what that looks like. Um, and again, all it does is copy the data from the uploaded S3, uh, you know, through the data sync service, puts it into the file system that's presented to the container. Container then analyzes the data in the file system and synchronizes back to S3. And data sync is an interesting service, and probably worth mentioning. Um, this this um, service. Once, when you use it, it takes us a bit of time to set up because, in essence, in the background, it's setting up some infrastructure to do a synchronization of the, of the files, right? Um, and it was there in, in the first place because the requirement was to basically pick up, at least from one of the companies, Chronostics, to pick up um, a large number of um, medical images, uh, transfer them to um, the EFS file system, and then process them and then get the results out into reports that would go into S3. 
Uh, and because of the large volume of data, a synchronization like this is actually more practical than trying to, you know, do, you know, transfer one file at a time. And data sync is really built for these bulk file transfers. But there's nothing stopping you from, impl from implementing it in other ways, right? So you could do other forms of transfer. You could use Lambda functions to do the transfers if they're smaller files, for example, uh, if you wanted the system to be more responsive, for example. But for now, because we're talking about a bulk use case, uh, we leverage this function. Uh, so the EFX, EFS is an interesting one because it's, uh, it's elastic in a sense that it will resize itself uh, with the data that you put in. So again, you don't have to worry about setting out the right capacity. It will just adjust to the needs of, uh, of your particular file system. So once you start adding data to it, it grows in size automatically to meet the needs. Um, and it's there because of an interesting feature of uh, presenting data from S3 into any, uh, any other system. Because S3 is not a POSIX file system, it's essentially a object store. What it will do is it will replicate the data that it holds in itself into the host where the data is presented. Now, if you do that into a container with a very large image or a very large set of images, that will cause problems. So EFS is there to actually present the data in such a way that you know, it's basically an NFS mount and your container is preserved in its, in its size. You don't have to worry about capacity in a container. Um, Fargate, as I mentioned, is serverless compute for containers. Um, and again, it's used with the uh, Elastic Container Service on, on AWS. It allows you to create one container, but you create a multitude of them. In this case, we're talking about a single container instance because it's just the first iteration of, of this workflow and it's, it meets the specific use case there, but there's nothing stopping you from say, having a number of parallel instances of this. So basically a, a, um, a parallel uh, computing cluster, so to speak, um, that could be invoked through a service called batch or, or from ECS itself to process the, the, the files, for example, in case you have data parallelism, process a large number of files all at the same time, take it through the system and then uh, deposit that data back into, uh, into S3 through data sync. Um, and an interesting feature of this as well is the need to actually visualize what happens with the data that's stored on, on EFS. So, um, you know, in, for that, we actually have a service called AppStream that creates an instance of a, a remote desktop, so to speak, that allows you to then interact with, you know, a remote workstation and visualize directly using, uh, you know, typical either Windows or Linux uh, applications um, and visualize whatever you need to do through the software that, that you're going to use. And again, Ben is going to show an example of that um, in a moment. And that is it. We're going to go to the demo now just to give you a, a sense of, uh, of what this looks like. Then over to you. Okay. Um, so we have made the code publicly available, although it's very much a, a work in progress. So we will continue to work on it, but there's, um, there's a fairly extensive readme with the same sort of, uh, diagrams and stuff and how you could actually, uh, start to use the, uh, uh, the code if you wanted to. Um, so. I guess we could go to the app stream first and hopefully I haven't got kicked out yet. Um, yeah, so this uh, is the uh, remote desktop. Uh, and what I did was I actually created a customized image that has the viewing software that one of the companies that's uh, interested in neuroimaging um, wanted baked it into the image itself. Um, the way that app stream is used here, I have them as on-demand instances. So you 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 have a choice in effect when it comes to how you build your fleets of of um, remote desktops uh, with uh, with AppStream. You can either have them um, always there, ready, burning uh, for whenever you want them instantly, or you can have them uh, sort of warm if you like, uh, and you have to wait up to sort of one to two minutes to get connection. Um, and the nice thing about just having them, uh, if you're willing to accept that sort of one two minutes. Um, it's considerably cheaper than if, if you've got the, the machines hot and live all the time. And just one minor point for anyone that might be interested in, um, in TREs, I've actually blocked copy and paste on here. So if you wanted to use this as a presentation layer for TREs, 
um, it's very easy to do um, and it's more difficult in uh, sort of other services, uh, sorry, other products. Um, it's literally just a code change within Terraform to, to deploy it. It's quite nice. Um, so in terms of like showing you the execution of the step functions, what I'm going to do is just drop uh, a trivial uh, text file into um, the upload bucket. Okay. And if I flip over to the step functions tab, that run has kicked off now. And if I was here, uh, we can start to see the workflow, uh, the workflow running, um, make it a little bit bigger. Um, this will take a little while to run through. Uh, because at the moment uh, we have to uh, to have a sort of a, a weight like a pole uh, for the data sync, and we think that there are some potential solutions to that. So I have no doubt that we will get rid of those weights and speed the thing up uh, when we can. But <clears throat> at the moment it waits five minutes at each step, so it'll take about ten minutes. Uh, so we won't uh, won't sit here and watch <laughs> watch the diagram. But eventually this whole thing will turn green, and uh, the data will be spat at the uh, spat out the other end. That's essentially um, what the step functions uh, graph looks like. And as Bruno said, although it isn't strictly necessary for what we're doing here, um, the nice thing about this is that you can bring in really, really complicated workflows and uh, and create your uh, uh, create your graphs. And I think that's probably about it for, uh, for the demo. Um, there is one question and um... I think I've seen this raised in another presentation today. How do you see the sustainability of using Terraform in the light of recent license changes from HashiCorp? Should I, should I take that one? <clears throat> yes, it's quite quite interesting, isn't it? Um, particularly because it feels very much like they've uh, or HashiCorp have reneged on their their sort of uh, contract with the community. Um, however, uh, obviously, I've I sat and read the uh, the FAQs and the the docs and their intent or at least their uh, the, the the way that they state it is that it's it's very much to uh, prevent uh, people wanting to sort of steal their business um, and you know people like scalar and so on they're they're, they're blatantly a rip off of the <laughs> of the uh, of terraform and uh, and they're not really in my in my opinion um, playing fair having said that, um, it is a little bit scary that HashiCorp have IPO'd and now they're driven much more by money. And so there's a risk that more and more things might start get hidden, um, behind a paywall as a, uh, as a result. Um, and I saw the stuff about kind of open Terraform and whether there should be a fork and I'm quite open and interested in that. Um, I'm, I'm despite the fact that I like writing Terraform and I find it a, um, a nice way to deal, not just with AWS, but multiple vendors and other, um, cloud related things. Uh, I'm not wedded to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bruno, any comment from you? I can simply offer, offer a comment as well. I mean, there are other strategies you can use. I mean, AWS specific, for example, so there's cloud formation, of course, it's native to, to AWS. Uh, and there's also uh, CDK, uh, which gives you some flexibility, right? So CDK is uh, the cloud development kit that allows you to write uh, the infrastructure as as code in your language of choice, right? So um, it originally started with TypeScript, but you can write it in Python, Go, you know, there's there's a number of languages that you can, you can do it in. Uh, and interestingly, there's also a uh, Terraform CDK that's essentially the same language, but with the, the implementation at the end, instead of creating uh, cloud formation stacks, it can create you know Terraform code, um, and that allows you some flexibility and ability to migrate if that's what uh, what you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. That's just a comment I would offer on that. Yeah, I think that probably covers the second question, which was: Is the workflow design available in CDK two? Which Terraform or CDK do you recommend for similar projects? Uh, I would recommend CDK period. Uh, 
so, so of course, naturally, mm -hmm. uh, CDK on AWS talks uh, naturally to, to cloud formation, and that that has some advantages because it uses the concept of stacks, which are essentially states of the infrastructure that's maintained in AWS. So you don't have to rely on an external entity to to support that. Um, but you know, CDK is the way forward, whichever. Okay, uh, we've got another question. What do you suggest using this workflow with legacy code? Um, if so, what's the best way of adapting it to the system? Yes, I mean, uh, one nice thing about uh, containers is, you know, there's, you, you can basically get legacy code that runs, say, on a traditional HPC system, for example, or, you know, Linux machine or Windows machine. You can adapt that naturally and uh, deploy it uh, on a container and then launch it in this system. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. It's, it, it, as per the workflow was described, you can see that it talks to a POSIX file system, so there's no issue around whether you're storing data on an object store or not. Uh, object storage there is, uh, it, it, it's, it's an auxiliary sort of way of storing the data for, for uploads and for presentation of the data downstream. Um, so it's, it's quite flexible. Uh, mm -hmm. you, could, you could use legacy code, of course. Okay, I, I don't think I see any new questions here, so uh, let's, so, sorry, which one? Uh, what do you suggest is the workflow available CDKG? What do you suggest using this workflow with legacy code, which I think we've covered. Okay, uh, let's give the um, presenters a round of applause. Thank you very much.